Western Asia. And I would like to extend my thanks to the International Association for Archaeological Research in Western and Central Asia and to Elisa Rothberger and Dominique Bonatz for inviting me and organizing this venue. I would also like to say thank you to the listeners for making the time to attend this lecture, given the short announcement and the time difference, and I hope you find it um, of interest. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Macquarie University land, the Watamataga clan of the Daruk Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and future. This lecture presents a summary of uh, research I have been conducting in the last 12 years regarding the genesis of Persian art. It is divided in two main parts. Part one aims at providing a general background to the status of late Elamite and early Persian art. Part two is dedicated to examining the genesis of Persian art through the eyes of one of the most iconic sculptures of antiquity. An art historical puzzle, the four-winged guardian angel from the first capital of the Persian empire at Pasargade represents a pivotal moment in the history of art. This is one of the most enigmatic, discussed, copied, and reproduced sculptures of the ancient world, and in a telling way symbolizes the extent of our knowledge about the genesis and formation of Persian art. The sculpture brings together artistic traditions from various parts of the empire, forcing close examination of distinctive artistic dossiers and cultural contexts that came together with the rise of the Persian Empire as the world superpower and the emergence of a new age of globalization. Note that throughout this lecture, I'll be using the label of guardian angel rather than the more common wing like genius, which appears throughout literature. When considering the status of the origins of Persian art, the scholar is confronted with deeply rooted narratives and stereotypes that define Persian cultural identity and the local Elamite heritage. In my view, three main paradigms have informed and in many ways continue to inform views on the genesis and formation of Persian artistic identity. The traditional paradigm is the oldest and has been shaped by classical accounts of Persian cultural identity with incorporation to various degrees of Assyrian and Persian royal inscriptions in the European language and religious studies, ethnographic pastoral nomadic studies, and traditional object-centered art historical methodological approaches. Early studies of Persian art were not concerned with examining the genesis and context of Persian art in its own right, but rather, rather as a means to claim Greek cultural exceptionality and to shed light on the Greek artistic revolution behind which stood the vital question of how, when, and where the West became the West. Consciously or not, this historical preoccupation with the roots of the West and with Greek achievements has had serious repercussions on the ability to query local artistic heritage. Classical sources were apparently unaware that the land where the Iranian-speaking ancestors of the Persians settled has been home, had been home to the ancient civilization of Elam. Therefore, a, co a conceivable paradigm of continuity between Elamite and Persian arts has, was until very recently, and simply, simply put, left out of the intellectual equation. An entire school of thought aroused giving license to the notion that Persian art was the outcome of the meeting of an Oriental people with the genius of Greek artists, I'm quoting here Seton, Seton Lloyd, and the elaboration of an often far-fetched, still prevalent theories focusing on the style of carving as evidence for ethnicity, which justified Greek authorship and agency in the genesis and development of Persian art. Not, for example, a recent book in French language by Henry, Henry Stirling with intriguing title, Persepolis, Masterpiece of the Greeks in Iran. These ideas encapsulate a particular tradition of thinking and feeling about Persia and its art, one that has enjoyed 
great prestige in the European cultural world for close to 2,500 years and has led scholars to ponder where, whether there is anything Persian in Persian art. This is by Anne Farkas. Highly influential in the English-speaking world, Henry Frankfurt expressed a consensus. There are no indications that the Persians possess a monumental art of their own, and there is no reason to suppose that the accident of discovery has withheld from us monuments of the pre achaemenid period. We should hardly expect nomadic tribes to extend their interests beyond the applied arts. Frankfurt epitomizes a body of talented scholarship that disregarded the millennial Elamite cultural heritage. It was during the 1970s, as a result of newly excavated archaeological material and of academic approaches that cast doubt over inherited art historical assumptions, a new historical history of Persian art began to take shape that endeavored to find a balanced voice independent from classical biases and consider Persian art from Near Eastern perspectives. This dominant Greek, the dominant Greek-driven model of influence was now replaced by a nuanced paradigm of Persian eclecticism, comprising foreign Greek, Egyptian, Assyrian, and Babylonian artistic traditions, which somewhat came together in the process of transformation, leading to somewhat something identifiable as Achaemenid. This viewpoint sustained a clear paradox. On the one hand, it, it acknowledged that the pre-empire Persian ruling class was well integrated into the Near Eastern sphere, culturally and politically, while on the other hand, it propagated the enduring releg relegation of the ind indigenous Elamite artistic legacy to the sidelines. More recently, an improving understanding of the Neo-Elamite period has led increasing numbers of scholars to embrace the thesis of continuity between Elamite traditions and Persia. Indeed, the notion that Elam play a major role in the genesis of the Persian ethnos and the formation of a complex state in force has been straightforwardly summarized by Mario Liberani. Persia is the heir of Elam, not of media. This model of continuity highlights a phenomenon of contrast, coexistence, and acculturation between Iranian and Elamite populations that set the foundation to the Persian ethnogenesis this is by Pierre Mirochenji. My own contribution to this conversation has uh, been through the Elamite, uh, through the lens of Elamite art, in particular, uh, the chance finds of the elite tombs of Arjan discovered in 1982 and of Jubaji discovered in 2007, both dated to the 7th and 6th centuries BC, in addition to the publication of the Elamite monumental uh, Highland Reliefs, um, have provided Substanti substanti substantiation, I think, to the notion that Persian inherited from Ilam critical, artistic, and ideological tenets. tenets. Traditionally, the beginning of Persian art commences with the emergence of the Persian Empire under Cyrus the Great and the construction of Pasargade sometimes soon after the conquest of Lydia by Cyrus II in 547 BC. Interestingly, according to the Nabonidus Chronicle, when Cyrus defeated the Median ruler Astyages in 550 BC, he took the Median treasure from Ecbatana to Anshan, which, as you know, and in greater part because of the limited archaeological work, remains an archaeological mystery. The other place that, in my view, also bears a great degree of mystery is Pasargale the presumed first capital of the Persian Empire. Plentiful descriptions of Pasargade convey an inorganic and invertebrate set of isolated areas whose distribution and orientation presents a challenge to the commentator, seeking to convey the ideological, practical, or environmental principles that might have determined the master plan of the city. However, Judging by, judging by the latest geomagnetic, geomagnetic survey analysis by French Iranian teams, it is becoming increasingly apparent that the topography, water, artificial irrigation systems, cultivation of plants and trees, and land management play a critical role at defining the particular distribution of monumental buildings 
community gathering areas, ritual structures, and living quarters within the city. Pasargade is associated with the old Persian term paradise. As you know, paradise, paradises, a garden, park, or plantation with the shared idea of a human-made and managed natural environment. While Pasargade is best known, is the best known example of a paradise, landed properties in the form of, of states with paradises were a pivotal economic and ideological tool of Persian politics that brought together under the protection of the king, the faraway dispersed imperial diaspora and local provincial elites. Black and white photographs taken between 1905 and 1928 by Ernst Herzfeld revealed the solitary sculpture of the winged guardian angel poignantly standing on a desolate plain amidst the rubble of thousands of stone fragments. Its survival is miraculous and baffling because this sculpture is believed to be one of a pair originally framing a doorway facing the interior of a hypostyle building known as Gate of the Relief, hence Gate R. The existence of this single relief has been explained variously with reference to Quranic passages and the assimilation of the ruins of Pasargade into Islamic tradition, including the conversion of the tomb of Cyrus the Great into a mosque in the 11th century AD. Whatever the circumstances of its survival, to this day, the guardian angel from Pasargade remains the single most important relief thought to have been carved during the time of Cyrus. At the time Robert K. Porter made his drawings in 1821, the relief included a short trilingual cuneiform inscription in Old Persian, Elamite, and Akkadian language stating, I, Cyrus the King, the Achaemenian showcase above the winged guardian figure. The last person to see the inscription in place appears to have been John Usher in 1861. And by the time the first photograph of the monument was taken in 1874 by Franz Stolze, a member of the German expedition in Persia directed at Friedrich Andreas, the upper section of the pillar with its inscription had been forcefully detached. Accordingly, its removal must have occurred sometime between 1861 and 1874. This head-to-foot, two-meter high enigmatic figure is one of the most reproduced sculptures of the ancient times, having been the subject of multiple and diverse, diverse depictions, descriptions, and interpretations. No less than 11 different original renditions generated since the time the first line drawing made in July 1811 by the British diplomats James Justinian Maurier and Robert Gordon exist. Sharp inaccuracies in representation which bear on contradictory, contradictory interpretations and corresponding aesthetic judgments come to view when comparing the drawings generated by the Scottish portraitist Sir Robert Kerr Porter the Belgian painter Louis Adolphe Tessier, and the talented Orientalist French painter Jean Baptiste Eugène Napoleon Flandin. These uh, um, drawings really contrast deeply with, the, with other drawings stri striving reconstructions of the ima imagery, such as those made by Coste and, and, and De La Foy, um, or with the more sketchier but originally original renderings made by Maurier. Gordon Herzfeld, who are under the port, or Anjalil Siapur. In addition, the line drawings produced by Porter, Tessier, and Flandin inspired numerous copies with various degrees of accuracy. That applies to the drawings, for instance, made by Vaux, Rollison, Wright, and Frankfurt. In sum, such is the number of contra contradictions that exist amongst these renderings regarding the crown, the head, the gestures, the garment, the feet, the wings, and the general body outline, that one wonders whether these drawings belong to the same sculpture. Sculpture in relief is a combination between two-dimensional painting and three-dimensional round sculpture, and operates in the shifting ground created by the two. 
generating what has been defined by Jeffrey Erwitz as an art of two and a half dimensions. The synthesis is fluctuating. The higher the relief, the more it is like a sculpture in the round. The lower the relief, the more it is like painting. Hence, the scope of possibilities and nuances in which to explore the treatment of form and modeling in the sculpture in relief is wide ranging. Much has been written about the sudden emergence of the natur naturalistic and realistic tendencies and interest in life form in Greek relief carving during the second half of the 6th century BC and early 5th century BC. This phenomenon placed the manufacturing abilities of craft workers at the service of imitation of the human body and established a key criteri criterion for evaluation of excellence characterizing Western art until the modern era. Far away from Greece and Asia, Asia Minor, the reliefs manufactured at Pasargade share on this curious trend toward naturalism, which could only be explained throughout the priests provide, provided by the traditional West-East dichotomy of Persian artistic identity and heritage. Henry Frankfurt described the overall, the overall manufacture of the ancient angel, guardian angel as purely oriental in design as well as in style. Carl Nylander also thought most unlikely, unlikely that the Greeks had anything to do with the cutting of the Pasargade reliefs, although theoretically proposed they might have been made by an oriental sculpture in close touch, probably on the spot, with people familiar with recent developments in Ionian, Ionian sculpture. Yet, in a coming sculpture, and Farkas argue for Greek influence in authorship, based on the depiction of the shoulder in profile. In her view, and I quote, except for the anatomically logical placement of the right upper arm of the genie, the sculpture of the Pasargade relief was a Greek working on a Near Eastern idiom. While John Boardman claimed the figure was not Greek, but oriental, suggesting that he might have been, and I quote, designed and probably executed by an immigrant artist aware of the new Greek mode of carving in relief. Henry Frankfurt described the relief of the sculpture as flat and lacking in plasticity as a result of its reliance on our ancient Near Eastern linear prototypes. He defined flat relief as emerging from the background in a parallel plane, not as the protruding mass of a three-dimensional body emerging from the stone. Following on from these comments, Edith Porada has to judge the relief to be flat, all details merely engraved upon the surface. It is striking, though, that Frankfurt generated a line drawing of the guardian angel reportedly based on the 1821 drawing by Barker Porter, which, which substantially departs from the original and includes numerous omissions, such as the rendering of the platform or the left hand, and also various additions, such as the bracelet and online outlines of the headdress. Perhaps the most significant difference affecting the historical corpus of line drawings is whether the artist attempted to illustrate depth and volume. This was achieved with various degrees of success by articulating slightly tilted angular and elevated viewpoints and by, by modifying light source by means of shading. These skills were variously exercised in the drawings made by the professional portraitists, such as Porter, Tessier and Flandin, but are generally missing from the other drawings. Another critical element in is the depiction of the platform where the angel guardian is standing. Porter used shade to portray volume uh, representing the platform where the, he is where the, uh, uh, three dimensionally. And a similar approach was taken by Flandin and by Herzfeld. This rendering exposes the right foot closer to the edge of the platform in a different pla plane and of wider volume than the left foot. Just such difference in location and depth carries on into the garments or its horizontal fringe and into its overlapping right section, which is dominated by the conspicuous middle vertical fringe. The middle fringe splits the relief in two, establishing a deliberate actual reference that orchestrates the modeling of the garment, or arms, 
head and wings. Clearly, the surface treatment of the, surf of the guardian angel is not flat. Carving detail is outstanding, showing perfect command of the engraving quality and minutia, not, for example, the mathematical precision exercised in the waving fringes and bracelets, or in the few remaining locks of the bears, or in the smooth modeling of the goat horns. Despite the relatively poor state of preservation, a remarkable ability at stone chiseling can be best examined by observing the relief from the right side line. Here, it is discernible that features such as the right shoulder, the upper arm, or the curvature of the neck or the waistline are finely modeled. Years ago, Anne-Brit Tilia noted that sculptures from Passargade had received an exquisite finish. The uniform character of precision and refinement in the work suggested technical knowledge of treating stone and presupposed, presupposed a long mastery of masonry carving tradition. From a manufacturing and stylistic viewpoint, these attributes gain on new significance when we bring into the interpretative, interpretative frame of reference the Elamite heritage of monumental highland sculpture. Here, I'm giving you a selective example, photographs and line drawings of the boulder relief from Kulefara III, which is dated to between the 8th and the 7th century BC. Many of the manufacturing attributes formally assigned to the style of Greek carving can be found in this relief. More importantly, the shoulder and the entire body were represented in profile. In addition, here we can also find the depiction of the three dimension of three dimensionally through the platform, volume and modeling, portraiture, portraiture and gestures that force us to look at the manufacture of Persian relief sculpture under a different paradigm. Now, I would like to briefly introduce you to the global artistic dossier of the guardian angel from Pasargade and to what has long been an artist art historical puzzle. There is general agreement. The Pasargade angel carries over the head an ornate Egyptian pharaonic headdress known as the Hemhem. Scholarship has struggled to explain the presence of the Hemhem crown over the head of the Pasargade sculpture. And while the crown screams Egypt, direct association with the land of the Nile has been ruled out since it was Cambyses and not his father Cyrus who conquered Egypt in 525 BC. The alternative option therefore has been to seek indirect pathways to the arrival of this peculiar Egyptian motif to the center of the empire. To my knowledge, the first to voice Phoenician participation in this endeavor was Marcel de la Foy in 1884. And since then, numerous commentators relying on the work of Richard Barnett have followed a similar path, observing Syrio-Phoenician or Levantine first millennium correlations. How and why the hem hem made appearance at Passargaden is, however, not so easily explained. In greater part, because the crown is almost an exact replica of the Egyptian hem hem worn by New Kingdom pharaohs. And I find myself in agreement with Carl Nylander in believing the Hem Hem crown raises several puzzling questions which have not yet adequately, adequately cleared up. The Hem Hem crown is a subdivision of, the diverse of a diverse plethora of crowns from Egypt that emerged within the New Kingdom, becoming a core symbol of royalty showcased prim primarily in religious complexes as thieves by the rulers Amenhotep III, Akhenaton, Tutankhamun, Ramses II, and Ramses III. The Hemham crown became um, disappeared uh, until uh, the Persian Empire, uh, with its mysterious em uh, emergence at Pasargade. The Hemham became the, phar the, uh, the pharaonic crown of choice and by Darius. Uh, counting with at least three different styles as exhibited in the temple, the temple of Hybis in the Karga oasis west of Thebes. It should also be noted that the Hem Hem became a royal crown of choice by Greco-Roman rulers. 
According to textual evidence from the New Kingdom, the word hem hem projects a range, a range of meanings defined by the actions of shouting, roaring, and moaning. In martial context, it symbolized the battle cry of the king, broadcasting the ruler's aura of luminousness in and outside Egypt. The hem hem preceded the king, and like its fame, making itself known to foreign rulers. <coughs> it may have not escaped your attention that a parallel tradition of a royal and divine ability to instill fear through overwhelming radiance, sometimes indirectly associated with the headdress, is also found in Assyria. In both cases, the divine crown radiated terrifying, overwhelming splendor that spread throughout the universe and permeated the actions of the monarch. In some, Persian alignment through the hem hem with previous New Kingdom rulers, and in particular with Thebes, deserves consideration. The display of a hem, the display of a hem hem crown, was not an odd exotic product of the imagination, but a deliberate choice rooted in well-established decorative, visual, artistic, and textual Egyptian canons and religious symbol of, and religious symbolism. No consensus has been reached among scholars regarding whether the Egyptian hem hem crown was placed mounted on a cap, on a helmet, or was placed directly over the head. Following the description by Porter, a group of commentators believed the head was covered by a cap or helmet. Porter described a close fitting cap sitting low behind almost to the neck and showing a small portion of hair beneath. Following Porter, Strona also indicated the guardian angel was wearing a close fitting ribbed cap. De La Foy was first as describing the presence of braids extending from the front to the back of the skull. In the same vein, Herzfeld insisted that it was really hair smoothly swept over the back and not a, a headscarf or a helmet. Edith Porada, as well as Margaret Root, described corkscrew curls like the hairstyles of the Elamites in battle scenes at the time of Asurbanipal. The criteria of what constitutes a portrait has changed throughout time. For political and military leaders concerned with showcasing their reputation, it was a matter of conveying genius and character, that is, a sheer value that provided the impression of identifiable greatness. There is no shortage of scholars and commentators that have considered the wing angel from Pasargade to be a representation of Cyrus the Great. The reasons are seldom stated and have little to do with facial features, but rely on the inscription formerly, formerly carved above the sculpture enunciated, enunciating I, Cyrus, the King, the Achaemenian. The guardian angel has a short, tightly curled be beard. This treatment offers a sharp contrast with the representation of the ruler with long beard and royal tiara in earlier uh, in Assyria and Babylonian uh, elites. I should note that image of royal portraiture with short beard appears to have been initially emulated by Darius I uh, on, on Ad Visitum. Here, Darius was depicted in larger scale than the two novels behind, both also depicted with short beards. This tradition was again manifested in the earlier seal of Kurash the Ansonite son of Tespes, where the victorious horseman was deemed to be a depiction of Cyrus I. Such earlier manifestations of portraiture raised the possibility, in my view, that the Highland Persian and Elamite elites originally shared a preference for short beards. In sum, it can be concluded there are firm grounds to believe the guardian angel was depicted in the Elamo early Persian tradition or royal portraiture. Incidentally, it remains a mystery to me who was the author of the popular version claiming to represent a portrait of Cyrus the Great and published in the 19, 18, 1894 illustrated world history. I believe though the drawing was based in the 1821 um, uh, original made by Porter. Beginning with the first line drawings of the guardian angel, conflicting depictions 
of the arms and hands were offered with the result that to this day there is no consensus regarding the gestures of the right hand, the absence or presence of a left arm, and when the left arm is docu hand is documented, the type of gesture that is being made. A closer look at the presumed location of the left hand confirms the observations of scholars asserting the depiction of two arms. This is endorsed by the remains of, of feathers in a triangular shape where the body and the left arm meet. That's in, in the, the blue arrow uh, in your, in your um, screen. Substantial surface damage targeting this section of the relief offers challenges to a reconstruction. But I believe one can clearly discern the left arm and the wrist protruding horizontal to the body. The outline of the hand follows a similar upward direction as the right hand, with a curve indent, presumably where the thumb was located. Afterward, the remnants of lines belonging to feathers provide the external boundary of, to the hand. Here the difficulty increases, but I believe the grounds to reconstruct an open hand with extended fingers are very slim, and it is more likely that the hand was closed into a fist, that is the left hand. The right hand with palm, palm extended in a greeting gesture has numerous precedents in Near Eastern cultic settings. Ilamite imagery provides, in my opinion, the best comparisons. A diverse corpus of metal, gold, silver, and bronze statuary from Susa, dated around the time of the Sutrukid house in 12th century BC, but portrayed the Ilamite king and various members of the priestly class in a cultic devotional pose with the right hand in greeting gesture while the left hand is depicted in a variety of poses and activities. This behavior was associated with an ancient, diverse, and dynamic polytheistic religious pantheon of divinities whose cultic centers spread from the lowlands to the highlands and the coastland. Many of these cults and divinities became part of the centrally sponsored religious pantheon of the Persian Empire. As noted by numerous authors, and in sharp contrast with Neo-Assyrian and late Hittite reliefs, the angel guardian from Pasargade was oriented inwards, suggesting the original pair framing the gateway gestured towards the hall, the principal area of official transit to Pasargade. No consensus also exists regarding, regarding whether the wind guardian wears shoes or not. To Maspero, the feet were covered with lace boots, while Herzfeld also believed the feet had have shoes, but Strona, followed by um, Margaret Root, believed the feet to be finely modeled and bare. Three sets of nearly contemporary references have the potential to shed light in this matter. There's the Elamite Ballet flat shoes with straps that you can see there in red, in the red um, 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 shape. Uh, the well-preserved naturalistic barefoot depicted in the release from Pasargade Palace S, uh, which is are in blue, or and the Persian low-cut boots with eyelet rings and tongue, characteristic of the time of Darius onward and onwards. There are arguments and counter-arguments favoring both possibilities. Yet I tend to believe, following Strona and Root that the mythical fit nature of the wing guardian strongly suggests that he must have been barefooted. It is undeniable that the type of garment worn by the wing angel is distinctively characteristic of late Neolamite ruling class and elites, with numerous scholars since Marcel de la Foy commenting on the close parallels between the costume worn by the Elamite king Te Uman in the Ulai River battle. Indeed, the adaptation of a long fringe robe with a border of rosettes does make a clear allusion to an Elamite recent past, whose most noticeable references also extend to the later Elamite ruling class, such as King Hani of Ayapir. One aspect of the garment, unnoticed by most, uh, most, in most renderings and by most, uh, mo most commentators, are the remains to the right of the central vertical fringe of a fragment of a fringe in the diagonal or orientation, 
and longer than the others, although its precise length cannot be determined. Next to the long weaving fringes, the only visible remains of ornamentation are found inside narrow borders with rosettes, which according to detailed line drawings renderings by Ernst Herzfeld, are composed of eight petals. In 1971, a line drawing of the Guardian Angel by the Iranian artist Mr. Jalil Siapur and published by Ali Sami came accompanied by an enlarged single rosette with interleaves. Following Sami in 1978, Strona also included the Garman rosettes, indicated the Garman rosettes had interleaves. The rosettes are poorly represented in most line drawings and their exact shape remains unresolved. However, however what, rem what appears to be a minor detail, the exact shape of the rosettes, emerges as an additional element in assessing the artistic backgrounds that may have informed the manufacture of the sculpture. Distinction between rosettes with leaf tips and rosettes with interleaves is not without consequence as the first were integral part of the rich floral decorative language of column vases and door sockets, slabs characterizing Persian monumental architecture. While rosettes with interleaves are attested at Pasargade in two fragmentary limestone slabs that seemingly belong to the door of the Sendan Tower, dated by Stronach to 545, between 545 to 530 BC. Rosettes, rosettes with interleaves also appear in a door socket found in the Sharhav Palace from Borajan. Equally significant, they also showcase prominently in the arts of Western Anatolia, where they, are, where they flourish in Lydian and Ionian artistic funerary contexts, decorating symbolic graveside door stele manufactured under Persian rule, mainly between 530 and 510 BC with later examples indicating continuity. The presence of these rosettes, this peculiar rosette at Pasargade and Borajan at the time of Cyrus and their popularity in Western Anatolia convey a new avenue of interaction that in my view remains to be examined. This evidence also makes the garment worn by the four winged angels from Pasargade the latest iconographic attestation of the typical Neolamite royal garments. And Darius I will change this tradition uh, and introduce the in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, court etiquette by introducing the finely textured white sleeve dress. A striking characteristic of the guardian angel from Pasargade are the distinctive two pairs of open wings emerging from the background of a body in profile. Numerous commentators have pointed to an ultimate original Assyrian origin for, the, for, for these wings, four wing guardian angel, promoting the view that it descended from an Assyrian protective spirit of the kind known from the palace of Sargon II at Horsavad. How this presumed artistic transmission between Assy Assyrian palace reliefs and the sculptural arts of Pasargade might have happened remains an answer although the possibility has been raised that some of the Horsabad reliefs were visible at the time of Cyrus. The origins of a four-winged human being or deity are obscure in time, but as a collateral outcome of this research, I trace the earliest depiction to the 15th century BC in the form of a Mitannian style hematite cylinder seal found inside an undisturbed burial in northern northwest Israel. In Assyria, a four-winged human or deity was conspicuously represented across multiple media. The best known examples are exhibited in the monumental palace reliefs and temples, but we also find them in sites representing embroidery in royal garments, seals, glazed bricks, stone relief plaques, ivories, and stamped on pottery. Traditionally live labeled genius, the gatekeeping activities of a four-winged human divinity provide a customary apo apotropaic interpretative frame. Scholars have combed literary records to find a match for these representations, with the strongest candidate becoming the sage Abkalu. 
a literary tradition going back to the Sumerian times, credited some Assyrian and Babylonian rulers such as Sargon II, Sennacherib, Esarhaddon, and Asurbanipal, and queens such as Nakia, with having the wisdom of being or being the offspring of Adapa, the legendary priest sage from Eridu. This tradition was well known in Babylon at the time of Cyrus, judging by a document known as a Persian verse account of Nabonidus, which satirically portrays illiterate Nabonidus as claiming, claiming to surpass Adapa on wisdom and knowledge. The text appears to align the founder of the Persian Empire with the millenary literary wisdom tradition that pivots around the Abkalu character of Adapa, claiming secret expert ancestral knowledge. Representations of the four winged being peaked in diversity during the Neo-Babylonian and Neolamite periods and flourished during the Persian period as centerpiece of the heroic encounter motif. Hence, <clears throat> to summarize and provide a conclusion, in this presentation, I attempted to provide a quick survey of some of the complexities and fascinating avenues of inquiry facing the art historian when examining one of the most intriguing sculptures and momentous political events of antiquity. Looking at the emergence of Persian art through the lens of this kaleidoscopic sculpture can be overwhelming. And I imagine some of you will be left with more questions than answers. But rest assured, there was, uh, that, that was a great part intentional because as you, can, you probably suspect, I hope to uh, publish a monograph on this subject. We carry a complex academic baggage dominated by cultural misrepresentation, historiographic biases, and negative cliches unmoded art historical methods of analysis and limited archaeological evidence. At the same time, as revealed by the winged guardian angel, something exceptional took place at Pasargade that forces upon the art historian reassessment of past narratives and realignment with the Elamite artistic legacy and the globalized world that emerged with the creation of the Persian Empire. It was within the, the, dialect, the, the dialectic established between the local and the universal, the old and the new, tradition and modernity that Persian art was born. Its originality hinged on a pragmatic capacity to draw on the inherited wisdom of Elamite local traditions to generate a novel, idealized, universal message of unity, stability, and harmony centered on and defined by the authority of the great king. He was, in short, and to conclude, a primarily autochthonous and purely Iranian phenomenon. Thank you for listening. And take the opportunity to, to wish you a, a happy new year and a Merry Christmas as well. Wonderful. I just have to stop the recording. Uh, uh, yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, Joey. That was fascinating. Um, this this very close look on one monument, one important monument. Uh, I learned a lot, really, and also to putting in this, yeah, research history context and all the other remarks. That thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, so now I'm just open for uh, questions, discussion.